Well, please turn in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We're going to be returning to verse 36, and we're going to add to that verses 37 and 38. So our text this morning, Luke chapter 6, verses 36 through 38. This, of course, is the Lord Jesus, his Sermon on the Mount, at least the content of the Sermon on the Mount. We are taking a life-changing look at the life of Christ. Let's take a look at God's word beginning in verse 36. Jesus says, Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. An interesting line in light of the song we just sang. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Let's pray. Father, here we are once again, your word laying on our laps. Father, may you get it from there into our hearts. This is rather important instruction, oh God. There are some here this morning that struggle mightily with these things. There are others, oh God, who are salt and light to us. They are an encouragement because we go to them and we feel not judged, we feel not condemned. Lord, continue to transform us, weed out the sin, and replace it with hearts of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. There's something in... Man, I want to say all of us that gra- gravitates towards that, the kind of likes revenge, payback. You hurt me, well, I'm going to hurt you. We can even find ourselves, at least I know I can, at time cheering, rooting for Revenge. Let me give you an example from a movie. I'm not sure how many of you saw The Revenant when it came out. It's been a few years now, but it's a movie set in Montana, and so it drew my eye. The Revenant is a movie that is set in the year 1824. It tells the story of a very masculine frontiersman named Hugh Glass who roamed the Dakotas and Montana. He was a part of a large hunting and trapping outfit when, while he was out hunting, he was mauled by a bear. And it was a grizzly bear and a grizzly sight to be seen. Though he did not die... During the grisly attack, he actually ended up killing the bear. He was expected to die from his injuries. They were grotesque. They affected his face, his neck, his back, his legs. He couldn't walk. He couldn't talk. Well, two men from the hunting party, Jim Bridger and John Fitzgerald, they volunteered to stay with Glass there in the wilderness, while the hunting party went ahead. They were to stay with Glass until he died, which is expected to be any moment, and then give Glass a proper burial. Well, the problem was Glass didn't die quickly. And so Fitzgerald, he gets nervous, and he ends up murdering Hugh Glass's teenage son, who was also with them. And he tricks Bridger 
into abandoning glass right there. Though he could not walk, could not talk, could not care for himself. They abandon glass. They steal his rifle. They steal his knife and all of his fire starting kit. They stole everything that would have given him a chance to survive. And they left him there in the middle of nowhere. Well, glass doesn't die. Instead, as he lay there on his back, he resolves in his heart to stay alive so he could exact his revenge. So the rest of the movie, it shows glass literally crawling miles upon miles, slowly healing on his journey of survival and misery and more near-death experiences, all so he could exact his revenge, pour out his revenge on Fitzgerald. And what did we do as movie watchers, as we watched this unfold? We rooted for glass. We wanted Glass to get his revenge. As a matter of fact, if he didn't get his revenge, well, that would be a bad movie. And of course, at the climactic scene at the end of the movie, he gets his revenge, and Fitzgerald is killed. And so we're all sent home with this sense of relief, satisfied that Glass got his revenge. We spent $533 million watching that movie in the theater, watching, hoping, rooting for Glass to get his revenge. And I'm pretty sure that not a single one of us sat in our seats sitting there thinking to ourselves, boy, I sure hope Glass forgives Fitzgerald. I sure hope, man, he takes it easy on him. Maybe he'll just get over it. You see, there's something in us that likes revenge. That even roots for revenge. Now, what you may not have known is that John Glass was a real person. Hugh Glass was brutally attacked by a grizzly bear to the point where he could not walk and he could not talk. Hugh Glass was abandoned by two men. One of them was Fitzgerald, who stole his stuff. And Glass did, in fact, resolve in his heart to go out and exact his revenge. He set out on a vengeful journey that nearly killed him, cost him his life a couple of times. But here's where the movie leads us astray. One moonless night, Hugh Glass, with his rifle in his hand, he finally caught up with Fitzgerald. He was only a few steps away from him, and Fitzgerald was sound asleep. It was an easy kill for Glass. His moment for revenge had finally come. As he stood there, he looked up into the night sky, looking for the constellation Orion, the hunter, with his sword in his hand. That's who Glass had dreamed about being in that moment. But instead of finding Orion, his eyes landed on Cygnus, the swan. Glass stared at Cygnus. And the more he stared, the more he noticed the stars of Cygnus didn't form a swan. They formed a cross. And as he stood there, focusing on the cross, his hunger for revenge subsided. And he walked away. 
And the peace that had eluded him since he set his heart on revenge came back like a flood. I wonder why Hollywood didn't tell us that story. Jesus says, be merciful as your father is merciful. Judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. You know, last week we started to unpack this passage by spending time in verse 36. And so we're just going to spend another moment or two on it this morning. But it will serve as our first point. But it's an important thing to wrap our minds around. Point number one is this, the call to mercy. The call to mercy. Again, verse 36 says, be merciful even as your father is merciful. And you'll remember that the word found here for mercy is not elios, which we would expect. It's oiktirmon, which refers to our loving, tender mercy and the compassion that God shows us that he gives us in response to our misery and our distress. In other words, we hurt and he comforts. We suffer and he sympathizes. We cry out in pain and he responds with compassion. An example of this is 2 Samuel 24, 14. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his oiktirmon, his mercy is great. Our distress met by God's mercy. And here, Jesus is calling us to imitate our Father's mercy. That's why our first point is the call to mercy. The call to mercy is a call to imitate our Father in his mercy. And as you know, it's not uncommon, it's not uncommon for kids to imitate their parents. We've heard Pastor Rick, as he preached, he talks about his young son who likes to pretend he's preaching just like dad preaches. And so he makes up a makeshift pulpit and he stands behind it and he brings the word. Last Sunday at the church picnic, I met for the first time Alicia Vann's daughter. I don't know if anybody else met Alicia Vann's daughter last week for the first time, but I thought for sure that I was talking to Alicia because the two are identical. And it's not that Alicia's old, but her daughter is young, but it was like stepping into a time machine and seeing Alicia 20 years ago. It was wild. Children reflect their parents, and the more that we reflect our Father, the better. And here, Jesus calls us to reflect his mercy to one another. And now he's going to get very practical about how we are to show the Father's mercy, how it should manifest in our lives, which leads us to our second point, the characteristics of of mercy. He calls us to mercy, and then he gives us the characteristics of mercy, or at least four of them. Judge not, condemn not, forgive and give. Judge not, condemn not, forgive and give. That first characteristic, of course, is found in the first part of verse 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Church, we're all guilty of judging. We judge people when we form a critical and disapproving opinion about them. And then we use that critical and disapproving opinion as an excuse not to love them. 
to not be kind to them as we ought. We, we don't like something about somebody. Maybe we don't like their attitude or their actions or their theology, the way they dress, the way they comb their hair, whatever it is. There's something about them, something about the way they look or the way they're behaving or the way they're presenting themselves that we don't like. That not liking is our critical disapproval of them. And then, because we've made this judgment, we then allow ourselves to withhold our affection for them, our love for them, our kindness towards them, our time with them, our niceness towards them. And Jesus cautions us against such judgments. To be clear, Jesus isn't teaching that we're not supposed to, or that we're supposed to turn a blind eye to sin, or that we're to refuse to point out error, or that we shouldn't discern between good and evil. As Christians, we have the responsibility to discern between right and wrong, wisdom and folly, good and evil. But what Jesus is forbidding are these critical disapproving opinions that we form of others and then we use those judgments as an excuse to be unloving and unkind. Remember, this comes right on the heels of what Jesus taught in verses 27 through 35. It's the same sermon that Jesus is preaching. He says in verse 27, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And then he repeats himself later on in verse 35. Love your enemies. Do good. Lend. Expect nothing in return. And so Jesus here is calling us, his brothers and sisters, to not judge our enemies. Don't judge the people you don't like. Don't judge the ones who irritate you, who see things differently than you. Don't judge them. Love them is the context. Characteristic number two, condemn not. Verse 37, the second half there says, the second part, condemn not and you will not be condemned. You see, condemnation is what follows our judgments. Condemnation is finding someone guilty of something that leads us to punish them, to treat them poorly. It's the unloving, the unkind punishment we dole out to somebody that crosses us. You see, judging and condemning, they go hand in hand. As we just learned, when we judge someone, we form these critical, these disapproving opinions about them. We use that as an excuse to remove our kindness, remove our love, and then that is placed, replaced with condemnation, with the punishment we think fits the crime. Condemnation seeks to punish the other person for the way that we're treating them. Maybe it's something as Simple, but hurtful is giving them the silent treatment. Maybe you give them a piece of your mind. Maybe you break off the relationship altogether. Maybe you're like Hugh Glass and you seek revenge. Now this, of course, doesn't mean that you can't correct a person or that you can't discipline your kids when they do something wrong. But there is a huge difference between correcting and disciplining out of love. They can be acts of love and doing these things out of condemnation. There's a huge difference between punishing my children out of condemnation and disciplining them out of love. The one is evil. The other is good. So becoming like our Father in his mercy means we judge not and we 
Condemn not. May I remind you of one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. Romans 8, verse 1. There is now, therefore, no what, church? Condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Characteristic number three. Forgive. The next part of verse 37 says, Forgive and you will be forgiven. We meet these wrongs that are done to us not with judgment, not with condemnation, but with forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Why is that the list, Paul? Well, because that's what usually comes out of us when we make judgments and we start condemning people. He says, instead, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We forgive others. That is our response. We forgive others because God in Christ has forgiven us. Forgiveness, it is not acquittal. It is pardon. Forgiveness, it doesn't pretend like the other person is innocent They never did anything wrong, nor does forgiveness pretend like you were never hurt or offended. Forgiveness is so brave. It honestly recognizes that you've been hurt, an offense has been made. But now, but now you choose not to dwell on it. You choose, it not, you choose not to use that against the person who's wronged you. You choose not to grow bitter or wrathful or anger or loud or slander or, or malicious. And you choose not to let that offense work as a wedge between you and the person who wronged you. You see, forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a pardon of things, of wrong, for wrongs done to you. Characteristic number four, give, give. So we have judge not, condemn not, forgive and give. The idea here is to bestow good on others out of a heart of kindness and love. Let me say that again. You're met with things that in your old life you judged and you condemned. Now, you no longer judge and condemn. You forgive, but you don't stop there. Now, you give. You bestow good on this person out of a heart of kindness and love. Jesus illustrates this generosity with the words, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Now at this point, early in the week, I imagined myself squatting down and showing you exactly what was going on with this little illustration. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to skip ahead to our modern context. Jesus is saying, don't be a bag of chips. Bags of chips are anything but full when you open them. You've got the big old bag of chips and you open them and it's like a quarter of the way full. I know they have their reasons, but it's still a disappointment. Instead, Jesus is calling us to be like the generous server at your favorite ice cream shop. They get out a cone. And then they get out their tool of choice to dig out ice cream from their abundance. And they start putting it in that cone. I've seen them flip the scoop around and start 
pushing it in with the back of the scoop. That's the kind of server I like. <laughs> and they just put layer and layer and they fill that cone and they make it a solid base. And the next thing you know, they switch scoops and they get these huge scoops, scoops that have no business being on such a small cone. And they go number one, and then they put on number two, and then they put on number three. The best ice cream takes two hands to pass off and to receive. When you hold that thing, the fear of God is in you that it might just tumble because it's so big. Don't be a bag of chips. Be like the person handing you that ice cream. Generosity is what is behind these words. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. To paraphrase it, give Give, give, give. 1 Corinthians 9, 7, God loves a cheerful giver. Don't be stingy. Give. So that's the four characteristics. But we need to add to this. It's great to understand what each of these individual things mean, but church, we also need to take these things as a whole. You see, these four characteristics are like four pieces of pie. I must have been hungry when I was writing the sermon. <laughs> the, I'm always hungry. Of course I was hungry. These four characteristics are like four pieces of pie. A piece of pie is great. A whole pie is better. And when you look at these four characteristics together, what Jesus is doing, he is combating our inner struggle with showing people mercy. Mercy is hard. We love revenge. We love judging and condemning others, and we're good at it. There's something in us that's satisfied when we make others pay when they've wronged us, when they irritate us. There's a word for this. I've been using this word for the last nine weeks of myself because I find myself falling into this trap time and time again. Here's the word, censoriousness. Sensorio what? Sensoriousness. It starts with a C, sensoriousness. Sensoriousness is a word used to describe people who are critical. It's the opposite of mercy. Censoriousness. You judge, you condemn, you hold grudges, you don't forgive, and you withhold your good. Censoriousness is the exact opposite of what Jesus is Describing here, censoriousness is a rotten pie that no one likes to eat. If a person has done nine good things in a day, then censorious person can spot the one place they screwed up. And then they let the person know about it. If a person has 95 theological convictions that match yours and five that don't, you focus on the five that don't 
and you push them aside. Censoriousness. Alistair Begg, he defines censoriousness as a spirit of self-righteous, self-exalting, hypocritical, harsh judgmentalism. Wow. An alternate spelling for censoriousness, at least for some of us, is this. F-A-C-E. B O. Okay. And I'm being a little censoriousness when I say that. Begg goes on to say, it is the kind of approach to people which seeks to avoid self-examination. It's one of the things I love about Pastor Rick. I've never once heard Rick come down hard on me. You know why? He's so busy doing self-reflection, figuring out where he is wronged, or where he is wronging others. Censoriousness, it's the kind of approach to people which seeks to avoid self-examination. So let's put that off. By highlighting and condemning the result the faults of others censoriousness brings with it the flavor of bitterness it is negative it is destructive it actively seeks out the faults of others and it is delighted when it finds them It is not simply that it identifies faults when it trips over them, but it actually goes in search of them and seeks to produce them. And having produced them, to hold them up before the individual and say, do you see? Do you see what you're like? Do you see how bad you are? How could you be so stupid? What's wrong with you? The the censorious person, the person that struggles with being censorious, it seeks others. When he finds them, he looks for something negative in them. He's annoyed by their happiness. And so he looks for an excuse to be unkind. And he just refuses to let things go. Do you sense any of this in you? Dads, towards your children? Wife, towards your husband? Boss, towards your employees? Townsman, towards your neighbor? Christian, towards your brother or sister? Do you sense any of this in you? I sense it in me. I struggle with being censorious. I'm censorious towards myself. I'm hard on myself. Jeff, how can you be so stupid? How could you how could you do that? I'm censorious with my wife, with my boys, with people I work with, with strangers who cross me. I'm censorious with some of you. I judge, I condemn, I struggle to forgive, and then I withhold my love and my kindness. 
And if I struggle with these things as your pastor, then friend, chances are pretty good. You just might struggle with some of them too. It is a sinful condition that many of us share. And that, my friends, is why Jesus so graciously brings it up. Our Savior, he's inviting us out of the jail cell of censoriousness. And instead, he invites us to the life of love and kindness and forgiveness and the joy of generosity. Jesus, how in the world, how in the world am I to change? How am I supposed to do that? And Jesus says, I'll show you. I'll show you what it's like to love your enemies. I'll show you what it's like to be merciful. I'll show you what it's like to not judge, to not condemn, to forgive, and to give. I'll show you on the cross. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus knows there's a little hue glass in all of us. He knows that we're tempted to go looking for Orion. Oh, but church, he invites us to fix our eyes on the cross. This text bleeds the promises bought for us on the cross. You will not be judged. You will not be condemned. You will be forgiven. And I'll give you everything that's mine. For your father is merciful. Loved ones, Focus on the cross, and you will find mercy both for yourself, and there'll be plenty left over for you to give to others. Let's pray. Oh God, we are so thankful for the cross, the demonstration of your perfect mercy. So, Lord, as we find ourselves guilty of censoriousness, judging, condemning, not forgiving, not being generous, oh, God, we must rely once again on your promise of being a God of mercy. We look to the cross. We believe in the cross And oh God, as we are met once again with your mercy, may it flow out of us as we are met with the heat of our enemies. Oh God, be merciful and grant us the mercy that others require. Amen.